Hello, hello, and welcome, welcome. Nice to see you all. Uh, this is Charles Kelly, and welcome to UK Property Talk. And th this is the, 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 the new show that I've got, which will be discussing all matters to do with property, mainly UK, but it could relate to other properties around the world as well. Uh, and we'll be going through you know, what, what constitutes a good investment in property, what's going on, the latest news and trends in property. And we've certainly had a few fairly recently. Now, property is very important to, to most Western economies. It's certainly really important to the US and the, and the UK economy. And you know, we're seeing in, in the US, for instance, that there are signs of a slowdown in the market. There's certainly signs of the lending market. Now, you, you won't see this on the mainstream news, but you, you will see it in blogs and, and, and YouTube posts by people like me that, that follow these things a little bit more closely. You know, the news gives you the big headlines, the war, the this, that, you know, this, you know, they don't really delve in deep to, to what's really going on. But lending figures are down in the US. Uh, now, the market here, uh, property prices, according to the Halifax, reached a record high uh, this, this week, the average property. Now, the average means, you know, across the board, because there, you can still buy houses up north in the northeast for 50,000. Uh, and, and, and yet down in, in the UK, you wouldn't even get a garage for that. In, in London, I mean, uh, where, where you know the average flat is four or five hundred thousand, just for a flat. So th there's a very wide variety in, in variation in the market across the board. But prices have continued going up. Now the Halifax and the nationwide surveys are reporting historical things, you know, from a month or two ago, based on their their information. But what I'm hearing from agents at the moment is th things are slowing down in that. Yeah, they've got, if they can find the right properties, they can sell them. If they can find the, the large three and four bedroom houses, then yes, they can, they can sell those properties. But uh, in, in the main, the market is, is kind of slowing down. Um, you know, th th there's not as many people coming through the door. And that could be a seasonal thing, but we'd expect in the summer now, there'll be more people out there looking. Um, but what we have got underneath that, the underlying factors is that, the, the economy is slowing down. Um, you know, the economy in the US slowed or it was in negative um, output in the first quarter of this year, January to March. The UK barely grew in that quarter, less than 1%, 0 0.8. And, and that was lower than expected uh, after you know, expecting to go into recovery. But then last month, it dipped just under, point, just under 1%, 0.1%. So it's not a lot, but it, it has, it's not growing. So as in any business, you want to see growth. If you're, you're just treading water, you're probably falling behind and, and getting stagnant. So that's what's happening in, in the UK. So it, it's not surprising that maybe people haven't got as much money to spend. Now, obviously, there are people in the UK that have got money. Uh, I, I was in the West End uh, this week. I, I was attending a, um, an, an auction and a talk. And I, you know, afterwards, I popped into to Selfridges for a bite to eat. Uh, that's a big department store in, in London, and they've changed it all. In fact, I think they've ruined it because they've ripped out you know, the old floors and made this big open plan thing with a big central escalator. It looks spectacular. But Selfridges has become a bit of a property business. They just rent space in, their, in their, their property. They rent retail space to all the designers. So everywhere you look, there's a, a Gucci and a Versace and a you know, Chanel, and there's, Chanel's got several places all around. And it's all very, very expensive. You know, there's no normal sort of kind of stuff you can buy there. It's just designer stuff. Uh, so I had a look around, went to, you know, look at some of the restaurants there. Very nice, you know, quite busy. But I was amazed at how many people there are there buying these expensive bags. And I'm always amazed by this, that you know, no matter how much you charge for something, you, know, you can charge five, ten thousand pounds for a, for a small handbag or, you know, 100 million for a yacht. And there's always people who've got that kind of money to spend. There's always going to be the, the super rich. And if anything, the rich have got richer over the last few years and the poor and the middle classes have got poorer, they've, but they've been squeezed. And that's exactly what's happening at the moment. People down at the middle and the bottom are being squeezed, but asset prices are going up. The rich are getting definitely richer and the, and the gap is definitely widening. I think we saw a, a narrowing of the gap you know, in the last 50 years, but it seems to be widening. That's in, in places like the, the, the US and the UK because salaries are definitely been, been squeezed. The cost of living in the UK is running at 7%. Higher inflation is running at 7%. In the US, it's over 8%. And, and 
salaries are not going up by that much. So obviously, if, if prices are going up by 7% and probably really going up by 10 to 20% in most cases, and your salary is going up by 1% or 2% or 0%, obviously, you're not going to have as much money in your pocket to spend. At the same time, lenders are, are tightening things up. So how can people get these big mortgages that they were getting to buy uh, huge properties? So that, that could be a factor in slowing the market down. Now, other experts say, no, 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 it's going to keep going up. Uh, there's a shortage of properties in, in the UK. They haven't built enough. So the market is going to keep going up like that. It doesn't go down. And, and when I hear that, I'm always worried, you know, that the market doesn't go down because any market goes up and down. The, you know, long term, of course, property does go up. But, but I'm sure there has to be corrections. There always has been corrections and, and dips and recessions. But if you look at the trend, it will go up and then down a bit, up and down a bit sometimes down quite a bit like you know we saw in the, the, the end of the in the 90, end of the 80s and 90s stayed down for many years 2008 down but then the trend is always upwards because yeah because people need somewhere to live you know they're not making any more land you know there's always going to be a, a shortage and the population of the UK has gone up substantially by four or five million since the, the Blair years uh, you know partly due to people living longer, uh, et cetera, but, but also due to mass immigration as well, that, that has to be a factor. Uh, so uh, you know, there, there will always be that uh, demand for, for property. We, we know that, right? So, but it doesn't mean you can't have a, a property recession. It doesn't mean that people at, at some stage might stop buying and then the market slows down and then you have to start reducing asking prices. So just, just watch out for that. Don't think that the market's gonna go up and up forever. The other factor we're seeing in property is the corporates coming in and, and getting into the build to rent sector. Now, they didn't bother with this before. They, they bought commercial prime properties, the corporates, the, the merchant banks, the pension funds. Now they're buying uh, properties for residential letting, which is, is a fairly new thing. Now I met uh, a minister, uh, a housing minister many years ago. He's still a minister now, I won't name him, but he said, uh, at the time that we don't want mom and pop landlords to, to, to deal with the, the rental sector. We want the corporates, these are the corporates, we want corporations doing this, you know, and I, I don't know why, um, but they then took away tax incentives for uh, little landlords who had properties in their own name and gave them to the corporates. They, they, they gave more incentives to them to, to, to build and rent. Now, I think what they're doing is, is absolving themselves from their responsibility, the government's responsibility to build more social housing. There hasn't been enough social housing built in the last 40 years. You know, I can remember as a child seeing lots of new council houses being built around the London area and many new towns being built, cities being built. I remember when my cousins moved out from North London, they lived near, uh, near Tottenham in, in Haringey and they moved out you know, there was a mother and father and the daughter and about three families all moved to Milton Keynes and they're still there. And that was when Milton Keynes was new. And it, to me, it looks a bit bleak and soulless. But when you go back there now, it, it's a lot different. And it's been a very big success. Milton Keynes is about, what, 40, 50 miles out of, out of London, up straight up the M1. So it's, it was built on a road. Uh, the M1, a major road up and down the, the UK, and the A5, and you know a couple of other roads crisscrossing as well. Uh, so it was strategically placed to be in that centre ground, and and, it, and they built not just houses, but they had a rail link also going in through that area. I, I don't know if the train did stop there at the time, but there's certainly a north-south rail link running from Euston right up to the northwest of Manchester and that sort of thing, and they they and probably up as far as Scotland, but they built it on that rail link. So they've now got a big station there. So you can get into London from Milton Keynes about as quick as you can get into central London from the suburbs, you know, because you've got fast trains going through. So it's very well planned. They had jobs there, they had, they had factories, they had warehouses, and they've still got jobs there. Still a popular place for offices, for logistics, for warehouses because of the position of it. You've got big Amazon places there, very close. So there's jobs there. So people don't have to travel from Milton Keynes necessarily into London or Birmingham to get work. And, and that's why I think it's been a tremendous success. And when you go back there now, as I was a couple of weeks ago, they're still building, you know, it's still expanding, it's still building. So it's been a great success. But what's happened since then? Well, virtually nothing. 
there's been no new towns, new, new major new towns anyway, built since that time, you know, in the, in the last you know, 40, 50 years, really. And Milton Keynes was probably planned in the 60s. So you're going back 50, 60 years when it, from when it was planned. And then, then nothing. And, and the David Cameron government said, when they come to power in 2010, we need, I think they said they were going to build six or seven new towns in the southeast. Uh, and then it was sort of shelved, and then it became, we're just going to build some garden villages and, and you know, uh, new urban, urban conurbations of, say, three or four hundred houses or a thousand houses, but all tacked onto the end, of, on the edge of existing towns and villages. So that just upsets the villagers and the people that live in those towns because they know that there's going to be no new infrastructure, there's going to be no rail link, bus links, and there's just going to be more traffic on the road and more people queuing up for schools and doctor surgeries and that sort of thing. So um, I, I think we need some more imagination. And that has now filtered through to, to landlords. I'm getting to the point here. Uh, now, it's like the private sector is, is, is seems to be responsible for housing people for social housing. And that was never really the, 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 the intention of private landlords. They, most private landlords would want professional tenants who work um, and you know, pay their rent. And, and, and when they've finished the tenancy, they probably go off and buy somewhere. That, that would be the normal thing. But now people are staying in rented accommodation much longer and, and, and to, to a much older age, perhaps sometimes into their 30s and 40s. So things have changed in that way. I mean, there are landlords in certain parts of the country that only exclusively deal with social housing benefits and that sort of thing, so that all their tenants are unemployed. But that, that's not what most landlords really were there for. Uh, and you know, in the past, those people would go into council flats, council accommodation, but there's not enough of that around because they haven't built any. And often, and they've sold a lot of them off as well to, to the tenants under right to buy. So now uh, private landlords uh, are, are increasingly taking more and more longer term tenants. And a lot of private landlords will, will say, well, okay, well, I've rented this property out for three or four or five years. Now I'd like it back. And they, they would serve what's called a section 21 notice to the tenant and that tenant then would would get the notice and they'd have two months to 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 quit the the uh the, the property and they'd go right in in some cases they might not go and you, you might have to take them to court but in most cases the section 21 would do the trick and it's called a no fault eviction because you don't have to give a reason you don't have to say well uh, i want you to go because of this this and this you don't have legal grounds or anything and, and it, it's worked quite well. Now there is something called a section eight notice where this, this is the one you would serve if, if a tenant is troublesome, if a tenant is causing problems, hasn't paid their rent, et cetera, trash in the place, whatever. Uh, that's a section eight, uh, which is more difficult to enforce. But now that there's a change happening. The government a couple of years ago uh, put forward a commitment to to abolish Section 21, and then the pandemic came and the lockdown, and it was all put on the shelf. But now it's coming back um, because campaigners are saying that this is all causing homelessness. Section 21 is the cause of homelessness, which is absolute nonsense. But now in the Queen's speech this week, uh, the Queen's speech means that they read out this speech, the royal family, and they say, this is what we're going to do in this parliament. So we're going to have a levelling up and representation bill, energy security bill, a Bill of Rights, this is when they're, they're planning to um, abolish the Human Rights Act. Uh, a Brexit Freedoms Bill, Public Order Bill, Non-Domestic Rating Bill. And then, this is what gets to the point, a Renters Reform Bill will abolish the so-called no-fault eviction, um, Section 21 evictions, and strengthen landlords' rights of possession and will seek to provide a fair and effective market for both tenants and landlords. Now, I don't know how uh, abolishing Section 21 will strengthen landlords' rights of possession. So we don't know the details there, but Section 21 is going to go out the window. And a lot of campaigners are calling for what's called open tenancies, where tenants can more or less stay as long as they want. Then you've got uh, people on the loony left, like Sadiq Khan, calling for uh, stricter controls, uh, rent controls in London, a freeze on rents for the next two years. Then you've got the, the Welsh government. They're, they're also on the, on the left. Sorry to be political here, but 
they've already started to bring in these things, more taxes on landlords. And what's happened in Wales? There has been a mass, uh, literally a mass exodus of landlords and now there's a shortage of rental properties and now people are having to pay a lot more. One, one, there was a story of a couple had to pay £27,000 up front just to secure a flat in Cardiff. That, that's crazy. And there's many areas where there's just not enough. They're having bidding wars for, for a property. They're saying, well, we're showing this flat to you know, 20 people. The asking rent was 600 a month, but we're, we're looking for higher bids to see if we can... So, I mean, this is not eBay, is it? You know, uh, but, but that's what's happening in Wales where they're also talking about bringing in rent controls. And that's what will happen if you bring in more regulation, more uh, restrictions on landlords, they will just pull out of the market like they did in the 1950s, 60s and 70s when there wasn't much, excuse me, there wasn't much uh, private rental properties around because people had what's, what, what was control, called rent control and secure tenancies. Uh, and, and they became what's called a sitting tenant. So you, you couldn't get them out. You couldn't evict them. Their rent stayed the same. And, and still up to this day, you can still buy uh, properties at auctions with a sitting tenant. So you might have a, a house and you think, well, that's cheap. That, that's a, a house that should sell for half a million pounds in, in Surrey. Uh, and it's, it's, it's guided at 300 uh, in the auction. And you think, well, what's happening there? And then you look and it says, has a sitting tenant. And that could be an old, old person, an old lady, an old man. It could be just someone, a family that's been there for years and they're on a controlled rent. Sometimes these rents go back to like 40 years. It hasn't, hasn't increased. It's crazy. And of course, then the landlord doesn't want to do any repairs and, and that sort of thing. And in the past, what you do, you get some entrepreneur, enterprising uh, property investors. I knew a guy that used to do this. He used to negotiate with the tenant on behalf of the new owners who bought the properties, usually in places like Paddington and that sort of thing, and ask them to leave nicely and pay them some money and, and give them, you know, find another property for them, find another flat for them. And I just, you know, he wasn't a heavy or anything. He just gently, he could talk to people. He could persuade people. He was a nice guy. Um, and he would offer them incentives like money. And a lot of people would take this money. They would take, you know, a friend of mine moved out of a, a flat in Stoke Newington, and I negotiated with his landlord, and he, I think he got three or four thousand pounds. This is years and years ago. And then I helped him buy uh, his own property using that money as, as a deposit. So obviously, in that situation, who would want to rent out a property on, the, on a tenancy when the tenant can stay as long as they like? Now, I don't know how this will work out because we haven't got the details, but they have to have some mechanism whereby the landlord has the right to get their property back when they when the tenancy is finished or when they need to have it back or if the tenant is disruptive and so i hope that the, the government will be sensible about this and and do the right thing uh by by tenants by landlords and tenants because we want a fair system but we don't want a system that that um disincentivize landlords from investing in buy to let because out of the two million buy to let investors in this country most of them are mom and pop landlords. You know, they've got one or two properties. They're, they're saving into property for their pension, which is a good way to save for, for their pension. Some of them are relying on the rent for retirement income. So, you know, if, if their rent stops, and it, it could be disastrous for them. So uh, most of them are not corporates. The corporates can handle these situations. A lot of small landlords find it difficult. And we've already had a raft of new legislation in the last few years that, that has made made life more difficult for landlords, more red tape, et cetera. So the last thing we need is even more burden on, on these small businesses um, and to, to disincentivize and put them off. Because whenever government bring, brings in you know, much higher taxes and more uh, red tape and legislation, it puts business off. They start relocating somewhere else. Of course, the big companies can do this. The Googles and the Apples can all say, well, we're going to domicile ourselves in Ireland to pay less tax, et cetera. Yeah, Amazon do the same kind of thing, so they don't uh, pay much tax on their profits. The profits is siphoned out somewhere else. But small people can't do that. You know, I can't domicile a, a, a property to Jersey or, or the Cayman Islands. Um, you know, so it, it's very difficult for this. As I said, the small and the the, the, the people at the bottom end of the, the ladder tends to be the, the ones that get squeezed, and and or some might say get screwed by by the system. And that, that is what's happening at the moment. So 
that's what's happening in, in the property market right now. I'm, I'm giving you the, the latest information, the latest trends. So does this mean that buy to let property is not a good investment anymore? No, I, I don't think it does. Um, there, there's still a market for it. Uh, you know, I, I, I know a, a, an old lady at the moment, she's got, you know, I'd say several hundred thousand pounds sitting in the bank uh, and the bank have not even increased their interest rate after three interest rate rises. Shame on NatWest for that. Shame on you, NatWest. Because I went in there and asked about it. So, well, we haven't increased rates yet. They are bringing a new account, but they know that most people can't be bothered to switch to this new account. In fact, I said to her, I'll take you into the bank so you can switch your money from this account to that account. Because she, she lives on that money. And, you know, she's already worked out in her head that, you know, after another five years or so, she would eventually run out of money and then have to do an equity release on her home. I said, well, you don't need to do that because if you just get a better return on your money, if you're only like, you know, quarter percent. Sorry, my camera just went off there. I think, I think I'm okay. Uh, yeah, so if, if you uh, have a situation where, um, I've lost my train of thought because the camera went off there. Yeah, she, she's getting like, less than a quarter percent on her money, maybe 0.1 or 0.2 percent. And she can just move that to another bank or another account. She could perhaps immediately double her income, right? Um, so that, that could make all the difference to her. But if, I mean, she might get half a percent somewhere else, but at least it'd be double the interest that she, she'd be getting. Um, but I mean, I mean, a solicitor told me also that he had a million pounds on, on account on average for the whole year. They got a hundred pound interest. That is pathetic. Now, but if she was to move her money into property and, and just bought a house and, and let it out, she, she could immediately get maybe three, four percent on her money as, a, as an income, as a dividend, fully managed. I, you know, she would, I think, easily get three percent, you know, which is not three times. It's more like 30 times what she's getting now uh, on, on income. Uh, and, and the property would go up in value. So it would, it would hold, hold its value against inflation. So in, in 10, 20 years time, that property would be worth more. She'd be getting more rent. If she sold the property, she'd get far more back. She'd probably get double or treble what she put into the property. And, and compare that with a bank account. She said all this money sitting there, hundreds of thousands of pounds for, for 20 years. I mean, she's 90 now, so you know, 20, 30 years. And what's it doing? It's just giving her a bit of interest, which she spends. And, and then the, the capital amount stays the same. Now, if, had that money been in a property, uh, it, it would have gone up in value by now. In 30 years, you know, if you just bought a property for, for 100,000 pounds 30 years ago, it'd probably be worth four or 500,000 now, you know, anywhere around the London area. So that, can you see the difference? So there still is a market for buy to let, um, but not everyone wants to do it. Of course, she doesn't want to go and buy a property at 90 years old and start dealing with tenants. Um, she, she just can't be bothered with all that, you know. Uh, but so I'm trying to explain, uh, compare the difference between having your money in the bank and investing it into something like property or even shares. You know, if you just bought a good fund, a safe managed fund, and it gave you a dividend of three or four percent, the fund should go up in value over time. I wouldn't put my money into a stock market fund right now. Stock market has been going down. Uh, the world FT World Index has had its worst run since 2008 in the last couple of months, it declined that means, as so I wouldn't put money into shares. But over that time, if she just had her money into a, you know, a managed fund, a unit trust, a, a mutual type of fund, um, she, she would have done a lot better for herself. We even put it into an annuity, she would have made more money. But um, you know, the fact is, if, you, if you're leaving it money in the bank, it's not invested, you are going to fall behind with inflation. And that's exactly what's happening at the moment. Uh, so buy to let is still, I believe still a good investment, but it's not as exciting as it was uh, because prices have gone up so high and rents have not, you know, rents have gone up as well recently, but they haven't really kept pace with the, the massive price rising. Um, so there still is a market for it. There's a lot of people I know that just buy a buy to let and forget about it. They give it to an agent and, and they forget about it. But there are more exciting ways to make money in property. And, and, and in future shows, I'll be going through those in more detail. But for instance, there is uh, commercials, um, you know, buying commercial property, uh, which can also be a very good investment, maybe repurposing commercial from commercial to, to residential, as we've seen a lot of offices 
disappear over the last few years to such an extent there's now a shortage of offices. But, you know, we've seen a massive amount of offices being converted into flats because the government allowed uh, this to be done under sort of permitted development. You didn't need planning permission anymore. You didn't need to change the usage. And, and that's created a lot more properties for people. Um, so that, that's one area is, is, is commercial. There's also small developments, buy, refurbish, sell, buy, refurbish, refinance and keep. Uh, this is where you can make a, a gain on, on what you spend for the property. So you buy a property that um, you can add value to it and make a, a massive gain at the start rather than waiting for the gain to come in the future. Uh, so, so those are a couple of things. Um, you know, you, you can do uh, serviced accommodation, like holiday type lets, where you can make a massively more uh, profit and income than you can on just a, a straightforward um, you know, buy to let on a, on a residential AST. You know, th there's all sorts of conversions going on, you know, pubs to, to homes, offices to residential, even now shops, which are suffering in the high street. A lot of shops have been turned back to residential because they, they probably were, in many cases, residential originally. So some of those shops are coming back to residential or maybe becoming smaller with residential units on the top and in the back, on the, at the back of the property, like a studio or something. Even in Oxford Street, where I was the other day, you know, the, 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 the biggest uh, long mile of retail in the country, the most profitable retail space in the country, where they had massive department stores of five, six floors up of, you know, the, the ladies department, the men's department, the children's, the sports, the restaurant on top, the household in the basement, clothing, perfume. Now, these shops are converting the uppers into to apartments, into luxury apartments, and having a much smaller retail space below. Some of the buildings are going to be knocked down. The Marks and Spencers, that, that iconic uh, spot uh, near Marble Arts opposite Selfridges, which was once the most profitable piece of real estate in, in terms of retail real estate in, in the country. It was the most profitable per square foot of all any retail space in the whole country. As Marks and Spencers were buzzing then, you know, you, you just had so many tourists coming in to buy in Marks and Spencers. That was their heyday, I guess. Uh, but now they're planning to maybe knock that building down and build maybe, I don't know what, flats, apartments, um, different types of retail spaces, maybe smaller retail, more restaurants, uh, bars, that sort of thing. So there's lots of development going on in town where things are changing. So there's opportunities for all of us, for you, for me, to, to get involved with this. Now, a lot of people say, well, I've got any money. I can't do these sorts of things. But believe me, there is money out there. If you've got projects, there are people out there willing to lend um, and, and they'll charge a higher rate and they'll get more for that than they can get in the bank. So the property market is, is by no means uh, stagnant or dead. Yes, things can slow down, things can go down and they, they usually go up again, but there's more to life than just buy to let. Uh, there's much more in property than, than just that. <clears throat> and I've only sort of touched on a, a few areas of property. If you haven't got any money at all, you can also get into what's called rent to rent. You can, you can rent a lease of property from, from a landlord that doesn't want to manage it anymore. And you can maybe repurpose it to a, to a HMO, to a house in multiple occupation, to a holiday let, um, and, and make, a, make a profit on that, make a margin on that. There's nothing new. This has been going on for, for, for decades. You know? so, and and there, there, there you don't need so much of your own money. You don't need to buy the property. You just control it. And, and a lot of people made a very good living from, from rent to rent. It's, a, it's a, I suppose, a glorified version uh, form of property management. So there's lots of opportunities. And, and in, the, in the coming episodes, I'll, I'll be going through more of those opportunities and talking about how you can uh, make money in property, sometimes using none of your own money. And we haven't even touched on land and building development and, and new builds and that sort of thing, uh, you know, building and finding plots that where you can add a property to it, like a corner plot of a house where you can see that, you know, they've got a huge garden on the corner, enough for sometimes two and even three other properties. And that's a massive planning game there. And, and you don't even have to buy the property. You can take it on an option, uh, you know, subject to planning. So there's, there's so many different ways of making money in property. It's not just about buy to let. So if, you, if you're planning on 
uh, getting into property, you'd like some help, some mentorship, um, you know, contact me. I'll put a link up there where we can do maybe a, a, a Zoom call, a, a half hour strategy call, which I'll offer free to people in, in these early weeks. I'll offer a free strategy call for people that would like to get into property but don't know how. Um, now you, I hope this has been useful today. I, I hope you found this useful. Uh, please give me the thumbs up if you have. Uh, but now you've really got two options. You, you can take what I've shown you today and just go and have a go at it yourself. Maybe try and find a commercial or try and uh, do a buy to let. Or you could do it the other way, the option two, which is how about if I could give you some help, maybe give you some mentorship, maybe give you some guidance and, and you know, help you and point you in the right direction and use some of my 30 years experience in property to show you how to, to do it professionally and make money. Because you don't want to be one of those people that just buy the wrong thing and then think, oh, this is a lot of rubbish. You know, this has all gone wrong. I can't get tenants. I can't do, you know, you don't want to be in that situation. So if, if you, you'd like me to talk to more about, uh, talk to me personally on a Zoom call, I'll put a, a link up there so you can click on that and book a, a free a strategy call with me then we can, we can look at what your property goals are and see how we can devise a strategy for you. What is a strategy? Strategy is, is like baking a cake. A recipe for a cake is a strategy. You know, if you have a, a cake uh, and, you know, you, you could try it yourself and just I'll throw that all in and put it in the oven and see what happens. Or you could go for a recipe. You could, you could use the experience of somebody that has done it before and they'll tell you, well, these are the resources you need. This is what you, you need to, to make the cake. These are the, the implements, the tools you need. And this is the order. You put those resources in and, and, and you know, the order of play so that you get it right, the timing, everything, so that you get the perfect cake every time. And that's what a strategy will give you, a, a perfect investment, a perfect cake every time. Can you bake a cake if you've never baked a cake in your life? Of course you can. People are doing it all the time, aren't they? They're, they're, they're going on these TV shows and winning prizes for cakes. And it's the same thing with, with building wealth. Is there a strategy for becoming wealthy? Of course there is. is. There is a strategy for becoming wealthy. There's a proven formula. There's steps you can take to become wealthy. Is there a strategy to be broke? Again, yes, unfortunately, yes. You can see the, the patterns and the habits that broke people follow. And you can say, well, you know, it, it's inevitable that, that person would end up with, with nothing. They've blown all their money. So what I want to do is help you Find the right strategy so that you can make money in property. And by the way, I'm the author of a book uh, which talks about leverage, uh, borrow and grow rich. It's, it's how over the centuries, the rich have always used leverage. They've always used other people's money, other people's knowledge, other people's time to get them there faster than trying to do it all themselves. And that's the beauty of properties that you can use leverage. You can use other people's money. You can borrow money to get you there faster. Imagine if you just had to try and save money to buy a property with cash. Now, by the time you save the money in the bank, earning nothing, the property would have gone up so much in value, you'd never get there. Now, you can use leverage, not just to, to save up and buy one property with cash. You could, instead of using that cash for one property, you could use leverage to, to use that cash for four properties and, and then have the income coming in to pay the loan. So that's just some of the strategies I, I want to talk to you about on the free strategy call. So click on that link below and uh, book a time in with me in the next week or so. Uh, I've, got, I've got a few spaces uh, coming up in, in the next 10 to 12 days. Let's check this out. So yeah, I'm, I'm sure you can find a slot there with me to talk about your property strategy. So thanks for listening. This is Charles Kelly, UK Property Talk. I hope you found this useful today and I look forward to joining me, for you to join me next Saturday morning, 10 a.m. UK time. And I, if, if you uh, are watching the recording of this, then join me on the live session on, on the following Saturday. If you're here live today, then have a great weekend. It's a beautiful sunny day in, in London. I hope it's pleasant where you are too. Thanks for listening and bye for now. Have a great day. This is Charles Kelly, UK Property Talk.